Today, as you can see, it's going to be a little bit different. We're doing um, a special panel on marketing for startups. So hopefully you guys get a lot out of this panel. We want to hear at the end if this is something that you like. If you have strong feelings one way or the other, we want to hear about it. So please let us know. All right, if you don't know, Kauffman Foundation is who created One Million Cups. It's actually a national program it's in over 115 communities right now. Kauffman actually started it back five years ago in Kansas City because they wanted to learn more about the entrepreneurs in their city. More communities found out about it, more communities found out about it. It has organically grown to over 115 communities today. Um, One Million Cups is a program designed to educate, engage, and connect entrepreneurs over one million cups of coffee. I think we're getting pretty close to that one million cups of coffee. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of everything about one million cups in the Coffee Foundation. How can you connect to the other communities in one million cups? There's actually a mobile app that you can download. You can connect with people in your community and people in uh, other communities. You can actually give feedback to the organizers. You can give feedback to the presenters on stage. You can check in. There's a lot that you can do with the app, so be sure and check that out. We also want to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, One Million Cups is a nonprofit, 100% volunteer run event. And so we really depend on our volunteer coordinators. We're actually looking for more volunteer coordinators. So if you're interested in helping put together events like this, come talk to us afterwards. Um, but also our community sponsors really, really help us out a lot. Thank you so much uh, to our sponsors for May. Hydro Coffee is here today, so if you haven't had their cold brew, be sure and check that out. Also, Tech Talent South has provided the coffee for this month, and we really, really appreciate that. Kurtu Treats which we all love, of course. The YouTube video is recorded by Dev Mountain. And of course, a huge, huge thank you to the Dev. They invite us into their space every single week. They're a, a great, great partner with One Million Cups. If you've never been here before, if you haven't had a tour of this space, please see Emmanuel afterwards. He will give you the best tour you've ever had. <laughs> and don't forget that on Wednesdays, there is free co-working here at the deck. So if you have never worked here, you can try it out for free on Wednesdays. <laughs> All right, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Trey and the rest of the panelists. Please stand up and give a big hand to our One Million Cups Marketing for Startups. Good morning, how's everybody feeling this morning? That was actually better than I expected. <laughs> um, thank you guys for being here at the deck and for One Million Cups. This has been exciting. We've been doing this for probably almost five years now. And interestingly enough, One Million Cups started in Dallas and Fort Worth on the same day um, about five years ago. So it's fun to see it grow. It's fun to see how you guys engage in it and appreciate it and uh, gain from it, connect from it. It's, I always tell people it's the best place in the community to get connected initially. It's the best place to come and find and meet people and begin to figure out where do you want to be and what do you want to do? How do you want to participate in the DFW startup community? So thank you guys for being here. And today, what a fun day. We've got something a little bit different set up and we've got this expert panel of marketing gurus, as I like to call them, um, here. And so we're going to spend some time talking through some things that startups deal with. I mean, we, we at the deck see every need that a startup ever has. And so often when you're starting a company, you usually have an expertise in one area, but not in another area. So if, you're, if your expertise is marketing, you're great, but then you're in trouble on the other side. So lots of times you see people come in with great product ideas or things like that, and what they really need is some help in how do I market, how do I get the word out. And so hopefully this panel will be informative and interactive so you guys can ask some of your questions as well. Um, typically when we do panels, I don't like to introduce people because A, they're especially for these, these uh, folks up here, their resumes and bios are exceptionally long and distinguished. And it's kind of embarrassing when somebody goes on and on and on about how amazing you are. So I like to let the panelists introduce themselves. And so I want to I want to start with you, Kevin, and go through and just, I want to hear a 60 second overview of who you are and maybe your favorite uh, marketing campaign or your favorite short story about marketing that you've seen in your career. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
Uh, Kevin Farrell. I am formerly a number of things, uh, New Orleans-based restaurant tour, uh, international correspondent for National Geographic, uh, the technology reporter for USA Today Travel. Uh, I'm currently the director of marketing for a Dallas-based real estate company called Door. And I think the most exciting marketing initiative that I've ever done was creating a site-specific bathroom arts installation competition in one of my restaurants in New Orleans. Uh, we had coverage in Vogue, we were named Best New Orleans Art Gallery of the Year in our bathrooms. We had uh, people like Big Frida, and, uh, Project Runaway contestants that all participated in it, it participated in it and uh, did bathrooms for us. And um, it was a really easy way to do something cool and get people talking about us. My name is Lindsay Harrison. I am the owner of a company called Eight Crowd Marketing. A uh, serial entrepreneur, started when I was really young, and I've been very blessed to be able to start companies and sell them. Um, November of 2014, decided that I needed to go into the marketing side of things because I was was pretty good at it. Um, had multiple clients start uh, right away, and we've exploded since then. We've cleaned ourselves as a fractional marketing agency, so we can either come in and take over everything when it happens to marketing, or we can come in and we can work with companies that already have a marketing team in place. Um, whether they don't have the expertise of everything it is that we do, we can support them that way, or they don't have the bandwidth to be able to do it, so uh, we help with that. My favorite marketing Thing that we have done. It was probably one of the most surreal moments that I had being in Warner Brothers corporate office in Manhattan, sitting there on a conference call with an influencer, um, doing a deal with them. They had a 26 stop tour across the United States and being able to uh, wrap their bus, being able to do gobos, being able to do influencer marketing with that, as well as having street teams follow them throughout all 26 locations. Um, that was a that was a pretty big one for us. Hi, I'm Mark Brinkerhoff. Um, I'm with Link Brink Communications. Uh, basically, uh, I work with startups, entrepreneurs, mostly tech, and uh, help them with everything from business strategy to brand communications, investor relations. Um, I actually started out, my first job was at Subway in the food court at the mall. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, that was a great proving ground. Um, I've worked with a lot of corporate brands, but um, I'll tell you there's nothing better than being on the ground level of something that could become uh, something special and amazing. So um, that was kind of my, my journey from corporate to um, the startup scene. And uh, I will say uh, one of the, probably one of the more um, significant or the, the, the campaigns that I'm, I'm most proud of being a part of is, I don't know, have you all ever heard of Before I Die? It was actually an art installation that started in New Orleans after Katrina, and it was a way for, for this artist to um, transform a building that had been uh, demolished into a community art project where people could talk about their blessings and, and their dreams and their hopes, and it's expanded into a worldwide art movement and uh, we brought it to Dallas uh, a couple years ago and uh, to other cities as well, so. So that's awesome. Um, okay, I'm Christina Levy. Uh, I run a company called Soku. We uh, do social curation, so we essentially build a technology that helps you hire influencers at scale, um, and then we provide support for people who are trying to figure out how to do that. I also teach at the University of Florida. I teach a master's level practicum in social media. And uh, prior to that, I used to run consumer PR at Microsoft. And then before that, I did a whole bunch of other things. Um, my proudest marketing moment um, is I, I created the first crowdfunding uh, campaign uh, to purchase gifts. So at Microsoft, I came up with this idea. It was called Chip In, and it was actually a way for uh, people to crowdfund the purchase of a PC right at sort of the nascent of that industry. Um, so I don't know, that was really fun. We got to build the technology, try things out. So that's what I got, Charlie. Sure. That's all I got. That's good. That's good. Well, before I ask my first question, I'm gonna have a sip from my hybrid coffee <laughs> <laughs> over there in the corner. I got paid Mexican, seventy-five dollars. Yeah, Mexican <laughs> vanilla right here. So, excuse me while I take a sip. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was great. Um, so, in Mark, when we're looking at a lot of people in the audience are either thinking about starting a company or have started a company. When, when you start your company, you're thinking about all the different things you need to do. What would you say, you know, one, two, or three of the first things you need to do from a marketing perspective? Well, uh, I'll say in a nutshell, know your market, know your brand, know your audience. Um, it's amazing how many uh, entrepreneurs that I've, I've worked with and actually people at all levels of the organization, big companies too, uh, don't really have any concrete idea about who they are and what they're about. Um, it's more than just an elevator speech. It's the ability to just say, this is, this, is what, this is what we do, this is what we have to offer, um, this is why we're different or special. And um, so I tell them, know your market, understand the realities of, of what you're trying to build here, and, they, and is there a place for it? It's one thing to have, to think that your, uh, your concept is great, your mom thinks that it's great, whatever. Um, that's fantastic, but it also has to be tested. And so do your homework. Understand your niche. Understand the opportunity that exists or doesn't. Be prepared to pivot. So know your market first and foremost. Um, know your brand. That is the ability to say in a few words and also be like committed and strategic about it. Um, that this is the business concept that we have and what we have to offer. Be able to sell. Be able to tell it. Be able to sell it. Um, and that's beyond just marketing and PR. That kind of goes to the core of you know your ability to be a salesman and on behalf of your company. Because um, every job has an element of sales within the organization, so get used to it. And then the third thing is know your audience. And so um, not every, not any brand is universal. Even Apple, even the biggest brands in the world. They have their detractors. Not everybody loves their products. Not everybody is a customer for them. And so know who, you know, know your demographics. Know really what you're trying to corner, where you're trying to target, and then be uh, disciplined about that. Um, just almost even one step above that. So one of the biggest things I encounter when working with startups is people don't have a vision. Um, like literally, like not what your company is going to do right now, but sort of like the vision that you're going, that you can get everyone in your business aligned to. And there is this book called Five that I like basically recommend to anyone, whether you're creating a personal brand or a professional brand. It's a little bit more personal. It's more probably for CEOs in the room. But it, it actually just helps you figure out what's important to you and what you want your vision to be. And I think that's like the single defining difference in companies that I see succeed and don't. Well, there's also a book called The Creator's Code, piggybacking on that. So The Creator's Code is, is excellent too, and there's actually a whole chapter on failure and the value of failure, so I like Perfect. So that's a great sort of start to think about, okay, I'm getting this company together, I've got to think about my market, my audience. Lindsay, taking that initial concept and pulling that into a comprehensive marketing plan. What are the things that you need to be thinking about or what are some advice that you have for people as they're thinking through that process? Yeah, so mine always starts when I talk to companies of uh, find out who it is that your customer is. So how do we do that? So if you are already a business that has been in business for a little bit, you need to go back through all the data that you currently have. Um, who is that person? Where do they live? Where? What are they spending things on? Where do they frequent? Um, if it's businesses, you need to do the exact same sort of research. So once you have that information, the next thing that you can do is you can say, okay, how much am I willing to pay to get that person or get that company? If you're a B2B, um, most of the time that's a, a higher expense for you. If you're a B2C, sometimes that's a lower expense. So what is that threshold? What is your ROI on the specific customer? Once you figure that out, then there are a million different ways that you can market your company, market your business. Um, once you have that number, if it's $3 per acquisition and that's what you feel comfortable with, don't go get a magazine ad. That's $6,000 a month. That doesn't make sense. Um, so look at what that threshold is. Once you get done with that, then figure out how are you going to keep those clients. So it's hard enough to get a client, but once you have that client, what are you going to do to make them feel special, to feel wanted, to make them want to continue coming back to your service or to your business? And those are the three things that we really kind of 
implement and walk through customers before we start anything. That's good. So acquisition and retention is key. And you touched on this a little bit, but Kevin, I'll ask you, how do you track the success of part of the And you talked about some pretty, uh, all of you talked about some pretty creative ideas that you use to build awareness and get people engaged, but and I know it's a lot easier to track stuff online when you can say, I spent this much, this is the response I got. But for example, with your bathroom concept, how do you know if a marketing idea works so that you can do it again or not do it again? Yeah. Well, I mean, in the case of the bathrooms, we've had, um, we had a neighborhood art crawl, basically, the second Saturday of the month. Uh, and so it was kind of a destination for everyone in the city already, and our, our restaurant was right in the thick of it. Uh, so it was very easy for us to say there is a line out the door of people wanting to come in, and we, we pair each artist with a specific cocktail inspired by their installation, and so we would sell drinks and you know have a, a packed house. So that was easy to measure. I think uh, more generally, you need to know what the goal is. We're trying to get in, my, in the case of my current company, we're trying to get people to buy and sell houses with us. And um, what we found is that all of the digital transparency in the world, you know, I'm able to see how much money I pour into Facebook or AdWords and, and how many impressions that got me and how many eyeballs on site. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate into people becoming our clients. Um, so as as lovely as digital is in terms of just being able to analyze and dissect it, you know, we found much better results in radio, which is so much harder to, to, to measure. Um, you know, we're in our seventh week of a radio campaign right now and we've had um, you know, upwards of $100,000 in revenue come into the business from that. Uh, it's a great return on investment for us, but it's a lot harder to measure what day, what time, you know, someone calling in is just saying, oh, yeah, I heard you on the radio. And so it becomes more difficult to, to narrow it down in terms of what, what was working about that. So I think you just need to know what, what the goal is with the, with the marketing effort. Are you trying to, uh, you know, are you trying to promote an event? Is the, is the goal just to have people in chairs? Is the goal to, you know, sell cars? Whatever it is, you need to, you need to know going into it. And that's really going to help you decide how to spend your money and your, and your time. Well, that's good. And you said something interesting in there. You said you ask them. You know, either they say, "I heard about you on the radio," or you can ask them, "Where did you hear about us?" That helps sort of give you a little bit of information about what, where people are hearing about you, where you're coming from. Yeah, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. you know, so we're in our second year of this particular company, and so we're at a point now where um, we have secondary and even tertiary, uh, you know, lead sources for us. Um, people might see a Facebook ad or come to an event and remember that they had read about us in the Dallas Morning News last year, and that they had, you know, seen us on Good Morning Texas. Um, you know, so the. The longer you are into your business, um, the more opportunities for touch points you have with your with your um, clients. Um, you know, I, I, I've read a couple different figures, but uh, something that like customers need to interact with your brand nine to eleven times before they ever remember that you exist or, or until you become top of mind. Um, so just assuming that you've, you've got to be pretty comprehensive in how you're reaching your people. Could you just, in 20 seconds, explain what Door is and why you're different than a standard real estate? Yeah, 20 seconds. Uh, so we are a flat fee, $5,000 paid to close real estate brokerage. We're full service. We use a lot of really interesting technology to sell our homes 14% faster. Uh, our average client savings is $15,000. We literally pay people the difference between that traditional 3% that you take in as an agent for each side, so 6% of the value of the home. We pay people back the difference minus that $5,000. So we're the fastest growing real estate company in North Texas history. Uh, we've quadrupled the size of our staff in just the past six months alone. We're in our, I think, 19th uh, month of business. And uh, we just closed out a Series A, and we're staring down Series B already. And full disclosure, my company actually hired Lindsay's company in December of last year because we were growing so rapidly, and we just really needed to cement a plan uh, I joined the company in October, or I joined the company in November, and we immediately hired Lindsay in December. So, um, in the audience here, in the green earrings, Megan is one of Lindsay's employees, but she's actually my closest colleague in, in what I do on a weekly basis. That's that's great. It's fun to see how it, it takes a team to build something like this. So, Christina, those of us who've been around the deck have seen you up here before. You are a mastermind of all different types of marketing, communications, PR. Can you talk a little bit about this, the marketing mix and what you think is most important? Is it 
is it PR, is it earned media, is it communication, is it Facebook ads? Like what, when you look at that mix, what's the, what's the makeup of where you spend your time or dollars? Um, okay, I'm gonna answer this question. Who here has a B2B business? And who here has a B2C business? Who doesn't have a business at all? Okay, so we're kind of a weird mix of B2B and B2C, and I think this answer is really different based on what kind of company you run. Um, so I have spent a large part of my career in PR, that's what I did for Microsoft, and then before that in social media, and now in influencer marketing, and I think they're all just part of the same mix. Um, I think sort of the more, I mean, I think the way you answer this question is really personalized for your business, right? I don't think there's, I think it's gonna be some like the stage of growth you're in and how much your company is worth and how well you've been funded or not funded. Um, I don't think you should hire a PR agency until you have a bunch of other parts of your business figured out. I think you can do in-house PR on your own pretty well often. Um, I think Facebook ads are super easy and simple for you to set up on your own if you know who your audience is to get really high conversion. I think you should 100% hire a marketing agency if you've gone through at least a seed round of over $750,000 and you have the money to spend on that based on your technology infrastructure. I think if you're a B2B company, um, I honestly think speaking at events is like probably one of the easiest and most effective ways to actually drive new customer acquisition, but I think part of that is like you have to be doing something interesting. Um, and I think at the end of all of these sort of questions is, are you an interesting company? And if you're an interesting company, then PR comes a lot easier, speaking comes a lot easier, um, a lot of the other sort of marketing things come a lot easier. And if you're boring and um, you don't do something innovative and effective, then you're laughing. But lots of people have boring and not different companies at all, right? And you're going to have to spend a huge amount of marketing dollars on um, and sort of other strategies, right? Think about LinkedIn advertising, thinking about paid sponsorships at uh, conference events. And so I don't think I've really very well answered the question with a straightforward answer because I, I think um, I think that's why you hire experts, right? Is you hire people who can help you figure out that mix for you. Um, but I think in my experience, there are a huge amount of like amazing books you can read to help you figure out what to do on your own first before you go and hire a bunch of people to help you if you don't have the money to actually hire people. And I think, I mean, if you don't have at least a few thousand dollars extra a month, then you probably don't have money to spend on marketing. And it's like a, a flywheel, right? Like you spend money on marketing and you make money so that you can spend more money on marketing, but a lot of it you can actually do yourself in the early days. Everything is very self-service. Like, even people who outsource and have people build their websites at the early stage in their game, I think is very often a, a waste of money because Wix and Squarespace, and you can create a functional website. So um, I think that's my kind of quite convoluted answer is uh, do it yourself until you have the money to hire someone and then um, talk to a bunch of people and get really good advice. And in the meantime, read all the books because every marketing person has written a book. Um, so there's tons of them out there. I think to speak to Christine's point, um, and I know we have young ears in the audience, sorry, but my I've been an entrepreneur since I was 19 years old. My first business was selling tumbleweeds on eBay. Uh, I paid for my first semester of college doing that. Uh, my rallying cry since the start of me running businesses was do cool shit. Um, and I'm a big believer that if you're flipping through a magazine or a newspaper and something is boring, it was paid to be there. If you're reading about something interesting, if it's cool shit, people are going to rally around that, they're going to write about that. Um, and that can take all sorts of different forms. Um, this year for the Kentucky Derby, two weeks ago, Lindsay, Megan, and I, we threw a miniature horse race in University Park. And we had 200 people show up at 9 o'clock in the morning to come to our, our Kentucky Derby. Uh, so it was just an interesting thing, and so people were interested in doing it. So if you do cool shit, people will notice, they'll perk up, they'll, they'll tell each other about it, but it's very difficult to market a boring, dry, 
Black well, I, yeah, like I worked at Microsoft, right? Like we did a lot of boring marketing at the end of the day. It, it, it is actually all about creativity. I also think it goes to the point about vision though. Like if you have a big idea for what you're doing, you can totally get people excited about that. Like our company is a workflow software, right? But I can get people excited about it because we're talking about democratizing influence which people get into, right? Um, and then from there, it's like how do you actually pull those things out creatively? So I think it's like big vision, a lot of creative ideation, and then trying the whole marketing mix because you find out that radio works for some people, it doesn't work for others, TV works for some people, some people are not TV friendly at all. So, yeah. I was just going to add one thing um, as an example. I, I went to high school with the guy who started Tom's Shoes, and there was nothing about that particular business on the surface that was revolutionary, right? But he had a vision, and he had a business model that worked the one for one. It was catchy, and it had social you know, consciousness to it. And word of mouth, I'm telling you, word of mouth is gold. So. You have happy customers. The best thing that you, the best thing that you can do for them is to ask them to tell other people about you. It's amazing how many times businesses, startups, do not ask their customers for anything in return, and it's not asking a lot just to say, "You, you loved the experience. Tell your friends. You know, we can use it as much help as we can get, as much awareness as we can have. So just don't be, don't be shy to tell them to spread word." So just one data point, um, so you will only make a behavioral consumer change based on the eight closest people around you. So each one of us will only like switch from a Ford to a Volvo or from, I don't know, Grey Goose to Smirnoff based on, no one's doing that, but <laughs> maybe, right? Um, and you do that only based on the eight closest people to you. So when you think about word of mouth marketing, right, what you're trying to do is essentially think about how do you trigger those people closest to individual sources to get them to continue to share the news. So then the other thing is in large scale data modeling of how news actually spreads about a product. It simply spreads by the most people telling the most other people. There, there actually isn't a tipping point. There are like that research is actually fundamentally flawed. There aren't these super influencers who can actually totally change your brand. So like at the end of the day, word of mouth marketing is the only kind of marketing, right? 90% of people assert, like in this survey, I didn't do the survey, talking about research earlier, but anyways, I believe in the survey. 90% um, of people, the way they want to hear about a product is from a friend. They don't want to hear about an advertisement. They don't want to read about it in a magazine. They literally want, like they're, no Kardashians, they literally want me to be like, hey Mark, do you know about this cool new company? So you feel in the know. So like I think at the end of the day, we underplay word of mouth marketing, but it is how people want to hear their information. Yeah. Sometimes it's cheeky. <laughs> So, so Mark, let's imagine that we, you have a company, you've got some money, and you're sitting there, you, some people just don't know how to do marketing, and you're sitting there looking at the $10 you have in the bank. Um, how do you break up that $10? What do you, is, there a, is there a standard percentage that you would recommend allocating to marketing in your business? Is it 10% of your budget? Is it 50% of your budget? I think, well, I think for a lot of people, I think for a lot of people, um, the thing you don't know how to do, you're willing to spend a lot more money on, and you sort of blindly throw money at something because you don't understand it. So is there a, you know, a, a generic or general word of advice you give to somebody say, you know what, just for starters, X percentage of your, of your budget needs to go to this or that. How, how do you think through that? Well, um, I'm in a kind of an interesting position in that I, I talk to clients and about business strategy overall. And so I have to be agnostic about marketing in the sense that marketing is important. And there are a lot of other things that are important as well. And things that happen that have to be done simultaneously. And so you have to understand how to prioritize um, and how to how to balance those those priorities. And so um, an interesting thing from the corporate world that I learned, uh, Coca-Cola <clears throat> devotes 30% of their overall marketing budget to experimentation. And what that means is that 
they're not expecting hard results from this. Um, it could be a big success, it could be a big failure. You know, we hear about ROI, and that is a fair question when we talk about marketing or really anything, is you know, what is the ROI? Because it is an investment. But Coca-Cola, as an example, they understand that a full third of their marketing budget is really about testing. It's about learning. It's about understanding what works, what doesn't work, what could work. What, as a startup, you, you can't be that, you know, um, willy-nilly with your, with your marketing, you have far fewer funds. But the, the essence is still there. And so um, what I try to tell the clients that I work with is, let's just talk, if you have a finite amount of money, um, it's better to do something than do nothing. Let's talk about what we can do well today. And in some cases, you have, uh, you, have a, you have a brand that is very compelling, and PR, you think, you know, we're gonna have a real shot, we're very different, we're very unique, and PR might be a really great avenue because people are more inclined to start talking about it, PR, it's your marketing, that kind of thing. In other cases, you might have to go with the straight, you know, ad advertising route. You might have to go, whether it's B2B or B2C, you basically have to be paid to be heard. Um, word of mouth marketing. So basically, it's like, let's, let's create like a menu of different options and let's decide based on the budget that you have what we think could be most effective today but then with an eye towards okay what's our next phase so phase one phase two phase three phase four always think ahead so that you're not like at a standstill wonder what you do next um, but yeah I, mean, I would say be prepared to experiment and so even if it's a dollar that's a dollar it's like pure experimentation doing you know uh, or be one of those, you lost a dollar. You can make another dollar. That's good. And so you guys have mentioned this a lot today, the idea of being an interesting company, the idea of being different, the idea of being something that stands out, that's cool. Um, I've never met a startup who didn't think that everything about what they did was a great story. I've never met a startup who didn't think they were the coolest thing in the whole world, even if they made, you know, um, Boring, boring business stuff. Uh, so, Kevin, you actually have a background as a, as a reporter. Um, and we ask this question a lot to the media, but for those of us who have an idea or a company, how do we get you interested as a, as a reporter to write about us? What are the, the criteria that makes you say, okay, that's, the fact that you launch your app is not a story. The fact that the app does X, Y, and Z might be. So what, what advice would you have to them from, from a media perspective? So I used to work with um, kind of the deck equivalent in New Orleans. It's called Propeller. And um, it's a co-working facility, but they also help launch 30 businesses every year. It's an uh, incubator program. And I was the, the press consultant, basically. Um, so I would help these 30 startups tell their stories, basically. And it was a, a class, basically. We, there were seven different stages, and I was like stage number five, how to tell your stories. And um, the biggest challenge that I run into over and over and over in these one-on-one -on -one meetings was just trying to get the startups to do something, tell something, get it out of their brain, get it onto Instagram, a, a website, just something, just show that you're doing something. Um, you know, I, I, I presented at uh, South by Southwest a couple years ago, and um, one of my panels that got accepted, but I ended up not doing was called, yeah, I'm sorry for the language, but it was called Fuck Your Press Release. Uh, and as a, as a former journalist, I never read a single one. They were just sent to auto delete if it said press release in there. I just would not, I do not care. I didn't have time for it. It was the driest thing in the world. Uh, and I know some of you in the audience would disagree with me here. Uh, I think so much more valuable than sending a press release is just forming relationships with people, um, reporters, Journalists are vain, just like everyone else. They want to hear that you enjoyed a recent piece of their work. Um, you know, find someone who has something to do with your business if you want them to write about you. Don't be pitching a travel technology reporter on your food startup. That doesn't make any sense. Um, but be strategic. Find three or four people in your local industry that you're trying to crack. Find three or four people nationally that would be, you know, wonderful if you got their attention to and start those relationships and 
Uh, and just let them know what's going on with you. Don't ask for favors yet. Don't ask them to do anything until you're a couple emails deep into that relationship. Um, find out if they're speaking at an event like this. Go, go meet folks. You're gonna be, you're gonna get so much more out of having a relationship with someone over the course of a couple of years because that journalist is not gonna stay at whatever establishment they're at at the time that you're pitching them. You know, in, in my career, I've written for Nat Geo, USA Today. Uh, you know, the Daily Beast have been all over the place. Um, and I've taken some of the companies I've written about with me along the way. Um, so form relationships, be mindful that honestly you're hurting yourself if you're sending someone a very dry press release. Because um, all you're telling them with that first introduction is, don't worry about anything I ever send you again. So be mindful of every interaction you have with, with journalists. And so. There's actually a... I think it's national. Uh, there's a networking group. It's called Hacks and Flax. So it's basically PR people and journalists who, and it's it's casual. It's low key. They get together. It's more of a happy hour situation. Um, the one in Dallas is every quarter. Uh, but that is that's a pretty. I mean, there's a lot of networking you can do. But effective networking, you should be looking at it very critically. Like, you know, what's the most valuable use of my time? And if you are a startup, go to one of these. I mean, you don't have a PR person. You are your PR person. <laughs> so put yourself out there and forming relationships. I mean, find a right opportunity to, to get in front of and meet journalists who can be your advocates as well. You have to begin. You have to. You can't be so nervous and stuck in your own anxieties that you're scared to talk about your company. You have to just understand that. Yes, in three months you're going to be better at pitching this than you are at this moment, but not unless you get started. Um, you know, just yesterday, uh, I'm on the, the board of the Dallas Press Club here, and there's an event we're trying to start, and they keep pushing back the, uh, the submission deadline. Because they want more, they want more. And I was just kind of holding firm, so we need to do it. It's gonna be so much easier to run this event in 2018 if we're able to show the video and the pictures from the 2017 event. Um, so you just have to get started. Yes, you will do a better job of this in a couple of weeks, but um, you have to start having these conversations in order to get better at it. I really agree that relationships are paramount, but um, one other thing that I think people forget is like, people like stories about people. People rarely like stories about your company because unless your company is actually truly unique and interesting, um, it's not different, right? And so like, tell your personal story, why you came to lead this company, why you are the only people who can. Or like, think about things that are happening in the news right now, right? So women in STEM is a huge issue. So are you like a white male founder? Awesome. Well, do you have like a young female engineer who you could actually position and put in the media? Like it doesn't have to be about you. What you care about is like, how many places can you put your footprint? So look at the people in your team and figure out what if those people are interesting? What if those people can you tell stories around? And um, you know, and then also look at like all, right, so I mentioned like women in STEM is a big topic, but then also like what are hot interesting things happening in the news and how does your company align to those things, right? Can you, we call it news jacking, I think everyone calls it news jacking now, but um, and not that you are like, uh, everyone makes the example of like Cinnabon and then the Star Wars woman, what's her name? Carrie Fisher when she died and how that was like really tasteless where they made like Cinnabons as her braids. Um, so, so this is the thing, some people thought it was really funny. Cinnabon obviously thought it was really funny. She would have thought it was funny. Lots of people thought it was tasteless, but they got into that news moment. So that may not be the way to do it, but there are moments where you have an authentic voice to have in a news moment that you can go and have those you can insert yourself into those moments as well. That's not saying, hey, this is my company and here's everything cool that it does. It's saying like, hey, we understand the cultural moments that we're a part of and this is how our company relates to those moments. So, thanks. And the, sort of a shameless plug for One Lady Cuffs, if you're trying to get better at telling your story, what better way to do it than stand up in front of 50 friends and practice your pitch and let them give you friendly feedback. So if you've not applied to speak at One Lady Cuffs or to share your story, this is a great place to do that. And you can go to dallas.1millioncups.com. Uh, one That's what I meant. <laughs> um, it used to be dallas uh, All right, so now I want to open up to questions. Can we borrow your mic to get around? Um, 
We've got about 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes worth of questions, so I want to make sure everybody has a chance to, to say something. Who has a question out there for our esteemed panelists? Over here on the right. Please raise your hand. On the right. You have a new product that you're wanting to market, and you realize that early adopters are probably your focus. How would you suggest that you identify and find early adopters? Identify or find early adopters. Well, I think part of it is, and this is like a common thing, you, you, have, to, you have to get out there. You have to ask people. You have to ask for, for their opinion. You know, tell, them, tell them your spiel. Ask them to test it out. Get honest feedback. I mean, part of it is you have to start somewhere, and especially if you're thinking, well, I, I have to have this large sample size or sample pool or whatever. Depending on what the product is, just start getting it out there and getting some constructive feedback that you can then build on, even if it's not necessarily you know right on target with the ultimate customer that you're trying to reach. Oh, I can't wait for you to my um, I think that question was softball locked from Ken over there, who I just recently met. So Ken runs a digital billboard sign, and what Ken does is he actually uses one million cups to reach um, early adopters in who would be interested in adopting his product. So I, I feel like we talked about that earlier, so that might have been part of his reason for asking, and a good thing for you all to think about. Um, the other thing is I've worked in technology, right, for the past decade. Um, we find it early adopters uh, on the social media sites that some people don't want to admit they go to, right? Like Reddit is actually a great, amazing way to find early adopters and get them talking. Um, but same, really true of anyone who's decided that they're interesting enough to have like a social media presence that they want to grow, is those people like to think they're in the know and they're early adopters. So um, I often think a good way to get in front of early adopters is to go to the people who are um, wanting to uncover and find products. And much before you ever go to the media, right, you're going to be going to those people. Um, and so I think both events and social media are sort of the great ways to get in front of them. Did I do you justice? What's your company called, Ken? Gorilla Signs. Gorilla Signs. They are uh, eight foot billboard signs that can collapse into the trunk of your car and they do push marketing through your cell phones. Okay, we have a question in the front here. <laughs> Howdy guys, I'm Josh. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so I have a question. In, in marketing, the, the goal of marketing is to attract your ideal customer, right? To get them to say yes to buy and, and to go through this. Uh, one of the biggest wastes of business is your non-ideal customer in, in dealing with like bad leads and dealing with like the wrong person and saying no. In your, in your thoughts, in your opinion, what's the best way to say no to a bad partner or to a bad client through your marketing? Creating that exclusivity. I'm going to do this one. My hands Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so one of the things that we do, uh, we meet a lot of people, and everybody needs marketing, um, and everybody wants to talk. So we sit down, and we have a conversation with absolutely everybody that wants to have a conversation with us, and we look at the good, bad, and the ugly. And I'm going to tell you the good, I'm going to tell you the bad, and I'm going to tell you the ugly about me, and I expect you to do the same. And at that point, you and I are going to have a conversation of this is a good fit or not a good fit for both of us. Uh, and I'm okay saying, I don't think that this is a good fit. If you can't celebrate success with me because we've done something awesome and we get excited and, and maybe we go out to drinks for that afterwards, you're not the right client for me. Um, so for me, it's having the honest conversation of, you know what, sometimes this is going to be a good fit and sometimes this isn't going to be a good fit. And being okay saying no to that. Yeah, not every business is, not all business is worth it. Um, actually, do you know Aiden Gill in New Orleans? Okay, so this is an, an anecdote. So he uh, he's an entrepreneur. He has a, a chain of upscale barbershops. He sells a lot of products, e-commerce. And he has a policy, and I've heard this with a, a couple of other e-commerce companies, that if somebody returns an item so many times, I think for him it's three, he'll just he'll write them a very nice note and say, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to please you, or you know that that, that, that our product hasn't met up to your standards, um, and basically go go find some another brand or the company that will live up to your standards. It's okay to divorce 
customers. It's okay to do that because otherwise what you're saying is I'm willing to put myself through the ringer no matter what for this one piece of business rather than saying this one piece of business could distract me from 10 pieces of business. So don't be prepared to walk, or don't be afraid to walk away. In and else, we use the 80-20 rule. It's a pretty classic rule. Don't let 20% of your business, uh, or don't let 20% of your, your business take up 80% of your time in the company. 80% um, of your business should take up 20% of your time as, as a company. Uh, and you never would tell a client, but we're using the 80-20 rule here. You're very polite about <laughs> defining business, but internally that's just, in one fell school, what we use to measure anyone who's becoming just a bit of a time suck. I think the other thing, right, is to think about partnerships. Um, so I will routinely pass people on to other companies or businesses that I think are better suited to them or can do a better job. Like, if you have a beauty product, I'm probably the worst person to help you promote it ever. Like, I just, like, don't use enough beauty products, right? But Lindsay, like, probably could be a great person for you. Um, so, but I think it's that, right? It's like having a network of other companies and businesses that you can refer people to. And then uh, one thing sort of in research that women routinely have is like a, uh, they feel a lot of social pressure if they refer someone to another business and then that doesn't work out, um, which is something that men in the research don't feel. So also like that, don't feel any guilt if it doesn't work out, right? Because you tried and, um, and it just didn't work out. I think that's my piece of advice. All right, we have time for one more question. Hi guys, I'm Steven and I just turned 19. I would ask this question, but my parking ticket's about to expire. So I can't, can't say too long, but my question is, if you could go back to the 19-year-old version of yourself and give one sentence or one paragraph of advice, what would that be, whether it's marketing related or not? Get over yourself. <laughs> I like it. Get over yourself. Perfect. It sounds silly. Um, I, I would have just enjoyed some of my successes more. Um, you know, always building you know, the next moment, the next thing, saving for the next project, building the next restaurant. Uh, I wish I would have just paused in between projects every now and then. I would say network. Um, so it's all about the people that you know. And network not being the people that can specifically do something for your business at that specific time, but network. So who are the people that you know, and how can you be part of the community to be able to start spreading those leads to other people as well, because it will come back tenfold. So when I was younger, the biggest thing that I did was go out and talk to as many people as you possibly can, and you never know, 10 years later, how that person will end up helping. I could not um, agree with that more. And I think my um, other point is you can teach yourself anything. Like your mind is amazing. There is a book or a YouTube video or like literally I built a brick wall a few years ago. It's still standing, right? Like you can teach yourself anything and you don't need a mentor. Like you, you can learn it all and there's someone out there who will teach you it for free. Awesome, thank you guys. All right, can we hear it for our panelists? Thank you so much. And before we're finished today, we actually have a special guest with us. We have Todd from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and he has a few things that he would like to say. Thank you, Lindsay. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Todd Smith. I run partnerships for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, I literally hopped on a flight at 5 a.m. today to specifically come for this event, um, and it's been amazing and has not um, let me down by any means. Amazing panelists, thank you all so much. Um, at the Chamber of Commerce, we have a mission to help small businesses and entrepreneurs like all yourself grow, and we want to provide resources and tips and tools to help you guys do that. Um, as part of our mission, we have launched a small business and entrepreneur series that will be in cities across the country this year. Our first event, we're very excited, that will be um, kicked off here in Dallas on June 13th. So, um, thanks for our great relationship with One Million Cups and Deck. Uh, you guys are all special invited guests um, of mine and Deck and One Million Cups to attend the event. Um, we'll have great speakers. 
Um, like the CEO of Fast Sides will have um, Cowboys Hall of Famer and Super Bowl champion Drew Pearson, who owns um, Pearson Companies is there as well. Uh, we have great partners like Square, who will be, um, be providing a Square reader for everybody in attendance. So we really, really hope to see you all there. It's June 13th, it's at uh, Irving's new innovation lab. Um, we will actually be the first event that they've done in their new entrepreneurial center. Um, there are cards at the front of the door that have a promotion code for all of you to attend. Um, and I'll be here as well to answer any questions. So thank you again, Lindsay, for letting me come here. And Emmanuel and Deck, um, it's been great to be here. And you guys are amazing. Hope we can be a resource for you all as well, too. So have a great morning. Nice to meet everybody. Hey, Lindsay, real quick, I just want you guys to take notice of the uh, of the Twitter handles for the people up here. Follow them, they are going to be spouting some great marketing advice, I'm sure. And so, what a great way to learn and see and continue to keep up with them. So, I just wanted to make a note of that real quick. Yes, definitely. Come up, take a picture of it so you have that information. Uh, all right, so just as a quick reminder, we are uh, recruiting volunteer coordinators right now. If you want to help put together great events like this and, and make partnerships all, all over Dallas, all over the US, um, One Million Cups has helped me do that, Profit Foundation has helped me do that. Uh, it's been a really, really great experience for me. So come talk to us afterwards. Also, follow us on social media, and thank you so much. If you have strong feelings, one way or against, uh, this is the kind of format we're gonna try again, I think it's at the end of June. So let us know if you want, want more of this, but I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you, please give another hand to our panelists.